I'm going to read from Western Avenue and other fictions. Um, basically, I keep returning back to the issue of migration and migrants. And in this book, I'm dealing with a lot of loss and disappearance in a community. Um, and some of it having to do with ICE, immigration, and customs enforcement coming through and having sweeps. And um, there's 14 stories, seven regular size stories, and then there's seven more almost like vignette stories, usually on a single page under 500 words. And those kind of start to stitch the book together. And they continue to return around a boy and a father. And it becomes kind of a buildings roman, uh, a consciousness being built through experience to maybe become the person who tells these stories. But what happens is, you can't tell if the buildings roman is about the son, the father, or maybe the place itself, the landscape. And I'm going to read some of those um, short pieces. Uh, this first one is Arrival, circa 1976, El Moro. His memory arrives with the geography of this photograph, a black iron lamppost, a white globe circling above the bluestone road, the forking paths and incandescent fountains, a labyrinth of arcades leading from the bright heart of the city to its darker edges, El Moro. That blackish sea sprayed wall, sentry of departures and arrivals, timekeeper of the azure sea. Palm trees sway in the breeze. The sweet smell of the rum distillery wafts across the bay tinged with smoke. The sweaty shapes of oxen struggling in a cane field. The fragrance of purple orchids beginning to bloom on the edge of a cascading waterfall bathed in the mountain green of dusk. Crouched down against the lamppost, he's dressed in a yellow and red striped t-shirt khaki shorts, and a pair of delicate-looking leather sandals. Beside him, almost solemn with newness, a valise the color of deeply bruised fruit. His father approaches, he turns, he hears it is time to go, clutches the valise, lets go, crouches even more, his butt barely touching the cool blue stones as he follows the designs of facades and porticos. Santa Barbara's church bell swinging with bass and echo within the arcade, the road, out toward the wall of El Moro and back again, like a sudden spark or surge, and he's standing. He turns. Inside the park of pigeons, men sit on wooden beer crates underneath the last tiger-striping shade of the trees their dominoes cracking, the sun slowly descending like a peeled orange ripe with heat, their laughter. His father lifts the valise, the pigeons springing up into the bluing evening light, suddenly alabaster as if written in perfection by a strange hand, perhaps spoken into form by a foreign tongue just on the edge of the palms shaking for the comings and goings of the sea. And the, the book, this book, like my novel, moves back and forth between the Midwest and uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, the second one is Finca, just like countryside. Um, there seems to be only the foundation, the cracked and weather softened pylons, a small rusted flywheel, a silver stream running alongside, catching against stones, foaming white. The stones suddenly tiny mountains shrouded with heavy mist. The banks overgrown, bushes, passion fruit vines, a flamboyant tree, some wild bananas. A molasses factory. Here cane boiled the syrup and bottled. The shell grayish brown, the planks of wood worn smooth from hard sea winds, the tin roof wrinkled torn in places and covered with leaves and dried cane stalks. Walls have collapsed. A china berry tree has taken root on the main floor, growing without care through a star-shaped tear. 
Most of the windows are propped open as if the kettles are still boiling, turbulent rivers of steam smelling earthy and dark, almost sweaty with work, the men in their smudged brown whites and jagged straw hats raising their dark arms, the silver slice of their machete setting the cane free in one sharp, decisive, crystalline cut. Steam, a dark green broken by egg-like hills of red clay dirt, a team of white oxen lumbering across a field, their silver haunches powdered with dust. My father's story coming and going without shape or sound as the seasons changed and the steam stream rose, roared, overflowed its banks, receded, then disappeared into a dry, pebble-strewn arroyo of silence. Sitting on a Coca-Cola crate, his blackened hands dipped into a wood bowl, spooning rice into his mouth. Like little pearls brought up from the deep of a cool sea filled with iridescent scallops and shells, oysters and clams, and the red seahorses, he once told me, that galloped on silver-crested waves on those late afternoons that seemed beautiful, elegante, the tin roof hot and shiny with the day's ending. The sea breeze softly shakes the windows, I still listen for the mill, wait to hear it turn with the sound of the stream gurgling over stones, the mill turning out deep, dark molasses, generating electricity for the lights strung across this stream, these lights lighting up the green-black night like pearls, scallops and shells, oysters and clams, a seahorse's vermilion wake, the stars marking the night's voyage. This one kind of a companion to the first one. It's called Avenue of the Americas, circa 1952. The, one of the main characters, Ernest, his father, his name is Chango. Standing against a wall, an immaculate white cloth draped a, over a tray, Chango, nine years old, stands military straight, a jagged straw hat cocked on his head, a tattered shirt smudged with dirt reaching just below his elbows. Coloring the pristine white cloth, three green and red mangoes, a pair of cow shanks, and hooves, a pig's foot, a chopped up ox tail. The translucent bones clean and vivid with blood with the succulent morsels found there. These butcher scraps, this reprise from his sore hands in a field holding a machete, this white cloth dazzling against his dirty clothes, his eyes, Chango must have washed it each night in a clear running stream. He heard singing of shells and stars on its shapely voyage to the sea. People pass, anticipating the briefest gestures of a hand in a pocket, the click of a gold clasp on a purse. He's ready for this woman who stops to buy a piece for stew. A few coins shimmer on the cloth next to a pale goat's tongue. For a moment, beyond his memory of fields, picking thorny pineapples outside Arecibo, harvesting coffee in the mountains of Lares, cutting cane in the low fields of Añasco, selling mangoes in a plaza in the dusk, my father follows the blue cobblestones of the avenue, catches the fading sunlight still bright on the facade of a lime green house. Within the undulating grillwork of a black balcony, in those delicately rendered cast iron vines of roses and leaves, seashells and stars, he gazes from within himself at a young boy who sees without the sting of sweat in his eyes. This one is like the title is longer than the little story. It's called Fallen. <laughs> It's called Fallen Leaves, Yellow, Orange, Green. 
The dormitories are constructed of concrete blocks. Their exterior is painted white, their rusty tin roofs shaking the men out of bed when the fall rain seemingly drop without regret. They look to be about six and a half feet tall, lined in even rows, six rows wide, six rows deep inside the cannery's barbed wire compound. Each dormitory is roughly 108 feet long and about 16 feet wide. Every odd numbered dormitory where the workers sleep, every even numbered dormitory where the mushrooms grow. Two communal dormitories exist, one for showering, the other for eating. It is night, a silver moon brightening the paths of grass and black dirt between the dormitories. One shift sleeps while another one sifts through the manured shelves, eyes squinting in the small circular light of their helmets, hands adrift in the stench of dirt, manure, and the invisible gas of fertilizer. Dawn means gray-blue light of dew and mist, Green helmets with small lights on their brims passed on to the incoming shift in the 20 feet separating each dormitory. For miles, the smell of celery, cows and pigs, wet chicken feathers, pickling spices, apples softening in the grass, the cool scent of mint and the river smells that fill this ripening, working valley. In the dawn, someone drives by and partakes of an odd, misunderstood ritual. Short, swaying arcs of bright light in the deep green field. I'm going to read this last one, uh, Shadows of Palms, because uh, the book is dedicated to my, my eight-year-old son, Charlie, but it's also uh, dedicated to my grandmother, my abuela, who died uh, just when I was finishing the book. The Shadows of Palms. Abuela Monsa stands in her open kitchen. Steam rises with the little song she hums. She dances and sways to her song, moving back and forth from table to stove. Sunlight slants into the doorway, banana leaves shaking in the breeze, Shadows entering in waves behind the sunlight and the leaves. A hummingbird flutters just above her shoulder, its ochre throat turning silver against the color of her hair. She works between this morning's shadow and sun. She chops garlic, onion, green pepper, cilantro, and tomato. She adds them to a pan of simmering rice pouring achote oil into the pan, the rice turning a deep yellow. She lightly rubs the side of my cheek with the back of her hand, smiles, and then turns over a small blue bowl, a stream of glistening gondules trembling into the pan. She spoons coffee into a boiling pot of water, then adds a small cup of cream and a couple spoonfuls of sugar. The kitchen. The doors wide open, windows without glass or screens, leaves and hummingbirds freely floating in, the sunlight filling the kitchen and pattering, patterning the white tiled floor with the shadows of palms. The salt, black pepper, olive oil, and the sweet smell of mangoes ripening on the table. The lush shaking of leaves, fruits hitting the ground in a deep thud, Abuela sandals scraping the floor, her spoon striking the side of a silver pot. Why is it now filled with such silence? Abuela brings me a cup of coffee, a plate of yellow rice and gandulas surrounded by slices of avocado. This old woman, her flowered dress, her silver hair, her dark skin, a calendar of sun falling into the sea. My first memory of my father's mother, the first time I tell myself, run a sharp knife across your palm, feel the small living gestures that count the most. Thank you.